keep an ear out for the health and safety advisory at you. Uh, the, uh, the segments apparently uh, had a, uh, a 
differential from the O-rings as far as the effect of the cold. As a result, the flames from the satellite rocket boosters actually went through like a blowtorch and 73 seconds into the launch exploded the uh, 500,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen in the orange external tank, destroyed the spacecraft. We lost seven astronauts that day. Uh, and also, we were so dependent on the shuttle program, we had to build another orbiter. Uh, so what we did out of spare parts, we built the Orbiter Endeavour, and that is uh, OB-105. So, uh, yeah, so you're looking at this Orbiter, you're seeing the nose and wings have what's called reinforced carbon-carbon. Stiff, they can take super high temperatures, however, I suspect they're a little on the heavy side. Most of the Orbiter was covered with black uh, uh, with uh, silica foam tiles. Silica foam uh, is very similar to glass, basically. It can take really super high temperatures, but it's over 90% empty space, so very easy to break. By the way, that's one of the reasons we flooded the launch pad uh, with the launch of the orbiters uh, with uh, over 300,000 gallons of water in 20 to 40 seconds to help protect the orbiters' uh, uh, tiles from the vibrations. Also, the sympathetic vibrations might have actually damaged uh, the tower, so that's one of the reasons we did that. And then the top of the order, uh, orbiter looks like it's covered with blankets. We actually call those quilts uh, thermal protection blankets. Uh, and what happened was earlier uh, models of the orbiter actually had tiles in that area. Uh, but we decided that the temperatures were such, like in the hundreds instead of thousands of degrees, that these quartz blankets would work just fine. And as, as a matter of fact, as a result, uh, the or this orbiter is uh, and Endeavour were three and a half tons lighter than Challenger or Columbia and it took half the time to build. And I was mentioning about my, uh, one of my space, uh, my beloved and I have been married 34 years. She's my best friend, of, a love of my life. One of my, uh, my uh, weight loss heroes is the Saturn V rocket uh, because it loses uh, five million pounds in two, min two and a half minutes. This is my second favorite uh, weight loss hero because it's 20,000 pounds lighter than any of the other flying orbiters. So uh, anyway, so uh, we were doing fine until, uh, well, yeah, come on, let's, let's talk about how we launch, first of all. So we kind of have like 10, 15 minutes left on this. We sort of need to be honest with each other, would you agree? Who, who plays with firecrackers? Come on, hands up, hands up. God, ah, good, 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 all right. So, a lot of us play with firecrackers or do something equally uh, interesting. And a lot of us have one of those wonderful neighbors. We get a birthday cards, they're awesome, but they're a little on the grumpy side. You know what I'm talking about? So imagine you're lighting one of your firecrackers and the fuse almost gets to the firecracker and that grumpy neighbor comes up. Is there anything really you can do about it? Nah, you're kind of stuck. Six and a half seconds before we launched a space shuttle orbiter, we fired the three main RS-25 engines on the orbiter because they were liquid fueled. They were fueled by the orange external fuel tank, uh, the 500,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And because they were liquid fueled uh, engines, they could be uh, steered or we could turn them off. Uh, and actually, we had situations where the steering called gimbling wasn't working right. We had to shut them down. However, at T0, when we fired our solid rocket boosters that were 3 million pounds of thrust each, when you fired those bad boys, buddy, you're going somewhere. It's just like our firecracker can't shut them off. You may end up in Spain. We have a landing strip. We, we have one astronaut who comes here frequently who had what was called an abort to orbit, which means one of the engines wasn't working right, so they had to go to a lower orbit than they intended to, but you're going somewhere because you cannot shut those solid rocket boosters off. Two minutes, seven seconds into the flight, those solids uh, would run out of fuel, they would peel off, they would parachute 
into the Atlantic Ocean and they were reusable. For the first eight and a half minutes, from T0 to eight and a half minutes into the flight, we fueled those three main RS-25 engines, again, as I mentioned before, with the half million uh, gallons of fuel and oxidizer uh, that we had in the uh, uh, orange tank. Come on. By the way, I do need to ask you a trivia question that's going to sound a little like who's buried in Grant's tomb or when was the War of 1812. Hmm. But for the first two launches, what was the color of the orange external tank? It was white. That's a good guess. White. They were white. We, uh, we actually painted the orange tank white for the first two launches until somebody pointed out that the only part of the STS, Space Transportation System, which is the official name for the shuttle program, the only part that we threw away was the orange external fuel tank, uh, and that was eight and a half minutes into the flight. And somebody said, why are we putting 600 pounds of paint on this thing when we're throwing it away at eight and a half minutes? So we stopped painting. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know what, uh, I, do, I don't think it was fortunately necessarily, but part of the problem in 2003 with Columbia had to do with the orange, which is the insulation that was on the outside of that tank. Part of it broke off and actually punctured the wing. It hit uh, panel 8. On, our, on that reinforced carbon, carbon punched a hole through it. We did not have adequate amounts of information, and I don't know if we could have done much about it, but coming back through the atmosphere uh, two minutes, uh, uh, or actually 16 minutes before landing, the superheated air from the friction of reentry went through that hole and destroyed the spacecraft. Uh, and that's how we lost Columbia. Uh, uh, and at that point, we were starting to think maybe we need to go in a different direction with manned spaceflight. And that's why uh, one of the reasons the, um, the uh, spacecraft of the Orion that we're doing now has a launch escape system like we had in the Apollo to help uh, protect the astronauts. Come on. All right. So, as you undoubtedly know, NASA uses a lot of acronyms. Uh, what's NASA stand for? You know this, I don't remember. National yeah, Aeronautic and Space Administration. I, I think I did know that. Well, recently, oh, sorry. the ends of your wings pointing up was a NASA idea. We actually work on airplane design as well as spacecraft. So NASA is its own acronym. Uh, you are on KSE Kennedy Space Center property. You probably rode on a BUS today. So we're really big on acronyms here at the Space Center. Well. Uh, in your video, you saw something that said nominal MECO, no need for an Ohm's burn. What does that mean? MECO is main engine cutoff. When we ran out of that fuel in the first eight and a half minutes of the flight, though that orange external fuel tank was no longer useful. It peeled off, broke up in the atmosphere, but these three main RS-25 engines were no longer of use. So, what could we, so nominal means they did what they were supposed to. So a nominal uh, uh, main engine cutoff means everything went just fine. Often, not always, we had to change orbits even when we ran out of fuel. How did we do that? We used these smaller engines uh, called OMS, Orbiter Maneuvering System Engines. Those use hypergolic fuel, which means fuel and oxidizer, when they touch, they burn. Uh, monomethyl hydrazine and uh, nitrogen tetroxide. Uh, and we, and uh, we didn't want that poor astronauts gonna have to get out with a big lighter and start the thing. Uh, so uh, we figured we needed it to work first time every time. So eight and a half minutes into the flight, you're going 17,500 miles an hour. You're orbiting, uh, the, uh, you're orbiting the Earth. We did it upside down and backwards. Why? Couple of reasons. First of all, we wanted to regulate the temperature. We opened the payload bay doors. The payload bay doors actually acted as uh, as uh, radiators, basically helped regulate the temperature. Also, a lot of the experiments were aimed toward Earth. But 
the black silica foam tiles also protected the uh, spacecraft better from solar winds, so therefore we could protect the astronauts and the contents of the spacecraft. So when we were ready to come back, what we did was fold up the, uh, the, uh, the uh, payload bay doors, and then we would fire, remember we're going backwards, we fired the Ohm's engines for three minutes and slowed down about 200 miles an hour to where you're going 17,300 miles an hour, about over Australia. Flip the orbiter over, nose first, and then it starts coming down. Come on. Now once we start landing, you are basically uh, in a flying rig. Basically, uh, it is a glider with no engines. Uh, so when we landed, we had one opportunity to land correctly. We could not fly around and try it again. One chance. Uh, and most of the time we landed here at the Kennedy Space Center at our 15,000 foot shuttle landing facility. Sometimes, less than half the time, we landed, landed at Edwards Air Force Base, and once we landed in White Sands, New Mexico, on the uh, on the desert, uh, on the on the big uh, flat. Uh, but if you want to see uh, kind of what that experience, we had to bank back and forth to slow down to the proper speed. You could actually find out what that banking was like, and then you could go down this slide, take off your shoes, go down that slide. Uh, and it's at the same angle of approach that the orbiter came back at. Uh, and I can't tell you how old I am, but it's somewhere between 63 and 65, so I'll let you do the math. <laughs> and I did it twice last year, so if I could do it, you can do it, trust me, but it's fun. But the, uh, the, there was an astronaut who said, it's not for the faint of heart as far as actually landing uh, an orbiter at that uh, angle of approach, but that'll give you an idea of what the angle they were coming back. Uh, so uh, a lot of people want to know, uh, number one, why did we stop the shuttle program? And number two, where are they now, as they say? All right, so uh, I mentioned earlier that we lost two uh, orbiters. Uh, OV-099 Challenger in 1986 was destroyed 73 seconds into launch. So we were, of course, now I'm, I'm mentioning two destroyed orbiters. The astronauts are properly interred. Let me just say that from the outset. But we were able to gather almost a quarter of a million pounds of Challenger to do the forensic research, find out what caused it. And then those sections are, for the most part, buried in silo 31 and 32 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Those are old Minuteman uh, test silos, and then we capped them off with concrete. However, we have one piece of Challenger in the forever remembered uh, uh, section of our uh, of our display down here. That is uh, a memora uh, uh, memorial to the 14 astronauts we lost in Columbia and Challenger. The families of those astronauts actually lent us items that we can uh, we can show you. And you go through there; it's beautiful and very somber. But if you hang a right, you'll see a piece of Challenger. And you'll see a piece of Columbia. Columbia, OV-102, uh, is uh, for the most part in uh, the Vehicle Assembly Building, the VAB. Uh, and uh, OV-101, the en uh, Enterprise that we never did fly, is in New York Harbor on the uh, Intrepid. Uh, and then uh, OV-103, uh, which is discovery. Now, I was a teacher for close to 20 years. I'm not crazy about cheating, but here's a cheaty way to remember this, all right? Discovery DC, all right? So technically, it's in Chantilly, Virginia, the Air Space Museum for the Smithsonian outside of Washington, DC. So that'll help you remember where that one is. You're looking at OB-104, uh, Atlantis and OB-105 Endeavor is at a museum in Southern California. So why did we stop the shuttle program? Well, uh, when we first started launching in April of 1981, 
the shuttle had a very big uh, potential, very big promise. One was that we would be launching very frequently, very frequently, uh, and as a result, get a lot of stuff done and accomplished in space. Probably partially as a result of that, it would drive the costs down. As a matter of fact, we estimated that the costs would be about $41 million uh, per launch, which is more than I have in my wallet right now. Uh, but it's uh, that's cheap for space launching. And we expected that the uh, disaster rate would be about 1 in 100,000. By the end of the shuttle program, the, dis uh, the uh, number of launches was considerably fewer, probably for technical reasons. I think as a result, partially from that, they, uh, the costs of actually launching went to 400 million to 1.3 billion per launch. And probably the most important issue was the disaster rate estimate went from 1 in 100,000 to about 1 in 67. So we figured that's just too risky and as many safety factors that they did, they put a lot of safety factors into the shuttle, but the fact is it's still like strapping the seat of your car to the gas tank of your car. There's something's gonna, possibly gonna happen. So we had to say goodbye. So, but the summer of, of 2011 was when this uh, very spacecraft uh, launched for the last time with four astronauts. The reason that we did four, we did not have a means of getting them back with another orbiter. This was the last orbiter to fly. So they were actually outfitted with Russian spacesuits in the event that they had to go back uh, on the Soyuz when they docked with the uh, with the uh, space uh, station. Uh, if this was too badly damaged, they would have to actually come back on the Soyuz. Fortunately for everybody concerned, they didn't have to, and that's what uh, that this came back, and you're getting to look at it. So with that, I want to thank you for coming with us on our tour of the Atlantis, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day here at the Visitor Complex. Thank you so much.